in that case, this is just an example where it's PFA only and, it, and the microtubule is observed. I'll give you a second example, uh, still in the theme of structure preservation. This is mitochondria, again in healthy cells. So fixing with PFAGA, right, so it's a nice strong fit to it. We see these great microtubes of uh, mitochondria in uh, healthy cells. These are just wide to limited, this is a little blurry. Uh, this one is supposed to be like Instagram uh, beauty shots, but it's the basic idea, hopefully you see. Here it is fixed only with paraformaldehyde, and during the antibody incubation step, there's usually a little bit of detergent. It's 0.1% tritinacin. And look, look at the mitochondria. What do you guys see? Donuts? I see pop donuts, right? So actually, you can see here, like look at this one, it's a crescent shape. That's not a curved mitochondria, that's a swollen pop mitochondria. Okay, so in this case, it's probably the differences in fixation could withstand, uh, allow the mitochondria to withstand differences in osmotic pressure better. And so, um, so that's one sort of important lesson that um, with this detergent um, and fixative combination, it can be a problem. But actually going to a milder detergent can do a better job. It's not as good. You see some uh, fragmentation in this sample. I think I had other ones when I did this experiment, this little test, um, where they were a little bit better. In, in any event, um, so there's a lot of variables, and it's going to depend on your sample, and it's going to depend on um, much of the, much of your, your specific goals. And so um, be careful. Careful is my key lesson there. And you, know, you always want to be thinking about what you're seeing and looking out for artifacts. The artifacts, the potential for artifacts, I think, goes up and up the more we do this, the more processing we do. So something to be very cautious about. Okay, so I'm going to proceed with some of the expansion specific stuff here. Uh, and second, first, stain. Okay, so um, you want to stain the sample. The idea here is we stain the sample before any special processing. So this is a fixed specimen. Now we're going to stain it. A lot of times we're using antibodies. So compared to fluorescent proteins, we find that when we antibody label, it helps to make things brighter. A lot of you guys have noticed that. If you do a good antibody label, you see a uh, much higher brightness. Uh, I think Lauren Luger talked about his spaghetti monster, um, highly epitope decorated uh, fluorescent protein variant. Um, and those sound really cool. I've, I've, uh, I've, been, I've been wanting to check those out, and uh, after the talk, I'm definitely going to check it out. In any event, we mostly like the antibody labeled specimens, but um, the protocols can work for um, intrinsic uh, preservation of intrinsic fluorescent protein signals. Okay, so here's an example in a culture cell. We've done it in a brain tissue as well. We just sort of didn't push it as much. Um, so uh, ERGFP, um, inner mitochondrial membrane in blue, um, uh, CS red on it, and we uh, preserve those intrinsic fluorescent protein signals. Okay, they're bright expressions, so you can see them nicely. Um, they're just giving a label in red for the outer mitochondrial membrane. So I've been doing super resolution for a while, a lot of the different methods, especially PalmStorm. We're doing some SIM now, we're doing this expansion, we've combined them. I've done a little bit of SED, although I've so far had less stuff with SED, but I'm sure this is good for the time. Um, in any event, uh, what I see is you need bright stain. Right? So if you're going to be zooming in to get more detail about these uh, structures, you just need really, really bright beautiful stain. And I gotta say, uh, I get a lot of collaboration requests and most of the time people bring a sample, they're just not ready. They're not bright enough. They're not ready for any of the methods. And a lot of times people wanna go from, okay, I'm doing my imaging at 0.3 NA 10X lens. Now can you go super res, you know, and make it awesome and you know, I need the cover of cell and they're, they're ready to rock and roll, but it's, it's just not, it's not bright. So it's a walk, jog, run approach. Say before you even try to do the super red stuff with if you're trying to do it in expansion method, make sure you've got really awesome stain and make sure that the let's say confocal imaging is really great. Okay, because once you expand, think about it, expand 4x, 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 you're you've got a 64x volumetric expansion, maybe even bigger, right? Because there's some protocols for iterative expansion, but now you're diluting your signal by 64x. So if you didn't have a really, really bright stain to start with, you're going to be suffering uh, later on. Okay? So I can't emphasize this enough that uh, bright stains are just critical. Um, I mentioned we like immunostaining. Um, another lesson I'd say the most common mistake for people trying to do our, and I hope of all the lessons you take away, this is probably the most important one, would you guys say, and they're going to emphasize it too. The most common mistake for the expansion protocol is using the wrong dye. The dye matters. The dye matters. 
says the expansion will probably be ready to roll. Um, so if you have a brighter stain, you could probably turn down the laser and get a similar signal. And that's why, and that's the thing we work on. When I say we work a lot on the sample prep, but we spend most of our time getting these really great stains. I hope that helps a bit. If not, we can add a little bit more later, but um, so, so maybe have a surplus. One reference point might be, you know, you mentioned the the YFP H. We we have like we have those mice around in GFTM, so that's like a space filling, fluorescent soluble fluorescent protein. And so so these things are like way overkill, aren't they? Or or not even. They're bright. I mean we were able to image those with the yeah. intrinsic fluorescent protein signal um, and pretty well. So non amplified. Non amplified. So um, and those features tend to be also not that small. Just as a right. uh, point of reference. So depending on what you're looking at, I mean, so it's a big volume. Uh, but yeah, yeah, those, those that I think that's a good reference. So if you're if you're using uh, YF, the YFDH, uh, that would be great. Right so uh, okay, uh, so most of our fixed imaging we use NCD images are anti-bleaching agents compatible with the Okay, the question was can you use an anti-bleaching agent? Uh, I think uh, it depends what, what kind you have, so do you want to ask specifically? Or are there any that do you use any? So so here's what I'll say in, in general for that. Um Dabco. Dabco, okay. Uh, I'm trying to see this mess on Dabco. I can say a couple things related to that. So let's say, well, we're getting ahead, but that's fine. We're, we're going to go through all this stuff. So uh, let's say you, you want to prolong the fluorescence and some that the these organic dyes are very sensitive to their chemical environment. Uh, and so the classic one is to use uh, an oxygen scavenging system and a something like a triple puncture. Um, so that would be like glucose oxidase along with um, uh, prolox or uh, acetic acid. So these are the classic ones. Some dyes that might give you uh, a thousand photons before dying can give you a million. Other dyes, actually, these dyes tend to be a little less sensitive to, to those in, uh, in the sort of oxidative environment, but um, they, they still get a, a, a substantial boost from perfect conditions. So that's a general statement about the dyes per in the chemical environment. So it can really matter. With uh, expansion, um, those gels can expand and they can shrink again. Okay, so if you go from high salt, which is the uh, hydrogel growth condition, to low salt, or no salt, it'll swell. Okay? And that's when you get the about 4x expansion uh, for most of the gels. If you put it back into high salt again, it's going to shrink. Okay? So if you need a buffer in there, you might get a little bit of shrinkage. Okay? And um, sometimes for the, these additives, for their proper function, you need a buffer. So um, I think all the stuff we published and showed, we didn't use um, uh, any of these additives to prolong the lifetime, um, but uh, I would be cautious about things you add, maybe shrinking the specimen. So you mount your specimen, and then you're like, okay, I'm almost ready. I spent you know, a few days on this, and then you add something that might be salty. It could shrink and detach from the mounting preparation that's been, uh, that's been stressed. So, so I say, dye choice can get you a good distance, and. Um, if you want to have a little buffer there, maybe you can. Maybe you're, you'll be fine. Just say, okay, I'm going to keep it a little bit buffered. Um, let's say 10 millimole entrenched buffer or something like that, and then I can add, put in a few additives that aren't too salty or high concentration, and then you might get a three or three and a half x expansion and maintain the osmolarity or the, the amount of salt in that solution during the imaging prep. Like let's say you just seal it or something, um, you should be fine. So that would be, but but probably a good test. You can. You can test a little piece of gel that's not your precious sample, see how it expands or not. We, we end up doing a lot of little tests like that. Yeah, so I'm glad you got that, to talk a little about the dye. I think uh, Aaron Tyler will also mention a little bit about the dye. So, uh, number one uh, problem to hear about. Okay, so let's, I'm going to sort of rewind now, uh, going back to incorporating the linkable group. Okay, so the way we do this is that after you have a stained sa sample, and hopefully it's really brightly stained, or maybe you've got a really strong expression of fluorescent protein, then we introduce some small molecule or uh, yeah, some kind of a uh, chemical group that can attach the fluorophores uh, or the label to the hydrogel. Um, so I mentioned yesterday we've got this small molecule. It's cheap. It's uh, I think it's $60 for a gram from uh, Aldrich. Uh, 
that are come up right here. Uh, the right side is going to react with uh, primary amines like lysines or terminal amines. And the left side is incorporatable into the gel. So this looks like some of the gel ingredients. Okay, so uh, here's a little bit of, let's say, uh, free amine on, a, on an antibody. And I think uh, antibodies typically have an order of 100 uh, lysines, and maybe a subset of those are available for reaction. Um, and so this would be the product. And this acryl oil group here, the E known, would be incorporatable into the hydrogel. Um, We've done some of our work, especially for cultured cells, with glutaraldehyde. The background we get with, with glutaraldehyde cultured cells is pretty minimal. There's also tricks like sodium oral hydride reduction. Um, we asked you about that if you want to know about it. But, but we tend to like the methacrylic acid for the most part better. But this will also confer um, some retention of antibody labels or chlorine protein to the hydrogel. We'll describe that in the paper. And, uh, Okay, so next, polymerize the hydrogel. Okay, so uh, let's see, we've got acrylamide, we've got bisacrylamide, those are the things you would be using if you're packing your own uh, gels, maybe for a page gel, or if anybody still does sequencing gels, they're gonna produce a lot of different sort of RNA, you can separate them carefully. Uh, so those are the same, the same ingredients, right? And you can even use some of the same um, initiators. Um, now, uh, the thing that's, uh, allow the hydrogel to expand quite a bit is this, uh, this uh, sodium acrylate molecule. Um, and so that'll become charged for <coughs> pH. And um, that's, the, that's the group that, that really prefers the uh, expansion. Questions? The specimen. So we've just been using uh, the same uh, method as Boyden Labs came up with, which is really cool. So you can use protein HK to uh, digest the specimen. That's gonna, um, Sort of take rigid structures such as, let's say, bundles of actin or other rigid uh, structures within the specimen, and it's going to loosen them up, right? So, by proteolytic digestion. Um, one might worry that you're going to chop up your antibodies into lots of little pieces, and the chlorophores that are attached to the antibodies, if it's not very heavily cross linked to the hydrogel, those might get lost. But uh, under our test, we see that we pretty much preserve maybe 80% of that order of magnitude. Uh, sometimes more 89% of the chlorophores uh, on, on antibodies. Um, with a very long protein HK digestion step would, however, kill the fluorescent protein. Okay, so we, we dial back the protease treatment to be relatively short when uh, we're trying to preserve intrinsic fluorescent protein signals. Um, I showed this uh, slide or an image uh, when we gave my talk yesterday, just to remind you guys again. A short digestion. <coughs> Let's say no digestion and cultured cells again, you see weird stuff. You see lots of little cracks, sometimes a big crack. So there's a bundle of microtubules here and here with a giant gap between them. So the, the specimen rips. Okay. Here you can see lots of little gaps. And this is a projection tool. Maybe it might have a big section. Um, and this is for the MAMHS treatment, that small molecule. A little longer digestion looks better, and much longer digestion looks good, although of course you still see a little bit of a little bit of crackle. You know, we're always complaining about the crackle. We wish we could make that a little smoother. Um, so for now, uh, it's quite good, but uh, you know, there's, there's a little bit of crackle there. Um, there will also be a certain amount of um, variability in the antibody labeling. Uh, and so some of the apparent crackle could be a, a expansion artifact, and some of that's going to be uh, telling you about the actually the how uniform label labels were applied. So when you take a really close look, even with other super resolution methods that re don't require any expansion, you see some amount of stochastic labeling, uh, and that's inevitable. Okay, then expand the specimen. Um, so I think we, we have some samples to look at, uh, but we weren't sort of designed as a handout to the, the crowd, although that was really cool seeing the giant brain that on the pastor. Uh, so that'll be in the sort of hands-on section that I think we're doing in smaller groups and trying to get started with. Uh, but here's what uh, an unexpanded hydrogel might look like, um, and I dyed it, well, Aaron dyed it pink so that you can see it. Um, so this would just be a little hydrogel that's the size of our cover glass that we're using. Uh, it's about one centimeter uh, in, in physical space. If we're using cultured cells, um, a lot of the brain sections uh, might be on that order as well. Um, there it is after expansion. Um, it's totally clear at that point, so uh, you know, for, let's say, 100 or 200 microns, 
big break section prior to expansion, you see it go through it very clearly. Uh, it gets uh, expanded and uh, in just by dialysis into uh, DIMX water. Um, I just thought I'd remind you guys a little stuff. Maybe a million years ago, you had a chemistry class, a physical chemistry class. Uh, I teach physical chemistry. Um, just to remind you to think about osmotic pressure, um, that's something that uh, occasionally comes up. There's even an equation. Um, I hope it may even look familiar. It's kind of like the ideal gas equation, T is equal to NRT, but pi would be the osmotic pressure. In any event, um, this expansion business, the simple explanation is that it works by osmotic pressure. So imagine, uh, let's remind ourselves, what is osmotic pressure? Okay, so imagine you have a salty solution that's an orange. And there's a little membrane here that can allow water to pass. We all know water's going to be rushing in there uh, to cross that membrane uh, and by diffusion, so minimize free energy. And actually, the osmotic pressure is the pressure you have to apply to uh, cause no net influx of water. So there might be a little water going in and out, but those rates of balance when it's at um, when that pressure of the osmotic pressure has been applied, okay, and it can be quite high, right? So. I give, I give examples in my class where, you know, um, uh, seawater is, 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 would require a column, I forget how long, but you know, many, many feet tall in order to, um, uh, to balance out this osmotic pressure. And so now instead of a, a little membrane uh, that's semi-permeable that sets up this sort of balance, it's actually the material itself, right? The material has all these charge groups on it, as well as the, you know, the hydrogel itself, the, the backbone. And those charge groups uh, lead to an influx of water, and essentially the hydrogel is its own membrane or something like that. So it, it sets up its own boundary. So anyway, just like with a sort of a squadron as I threw in here to uh, help you guys think about what you might be doing. Um, I was trying to stress yesterday that validation is important. Okay, so if you're looking at something that you know the answer and you just want to see how many times it occurs or something, then maybe you don't have to worry about it as much because you know what it should look like. But maybe you're not. Maybe you're trying to see if you're going to see something for the first time. Okay. If that's the scenario, you, you kind of want to be pretty careful about what you're doing. You want to know that you didn't just rip something in half instead of seeing a novel structure. So um, uh, we do a lot of correlative imaging in order to uh, convince ourselves that we didn't do anything too weird. And it's kind of annoying. Um, uh, you know, the first time we did it, we stressed out a lot about it. And then it got better and better. Actually, it's harder with cultured cells than with brain. With brain, you've got a lot of anatomical landmarks. Um, what we found overall, though, is we will prepare a sample, we'll do low mag imaging before expansion, okay, and before doing the hydrogel. If you try to image um, in the hydrogel with some lingering free radicals, sometimes things get uh, weird. It's like having a little bit of oxidant left in the solution and it'll leak fast. So that's maybe the second most common um, question you get. Oh, I was trying to image it beforehand and everything just leaked as quickly. Um, and so, you know, we, uh, we suggest not imaging until it expands and gets washed out. In any event, we get we get a low mag image uh, and that'll give us like a little map, right? So if you have a little, little map of your brain section, um, here we've got a little map of cultured cells and then maybe we had identified some things we wanted to look at. And then we can go in and then when we do high res imaging, we'll know which cell we're looking at and actually the way we've actually done this, um, there's a few things going on here. I just kind of highlight a couple specific points. This is a really low mag image. Uh, I forget it was like four x or maybe we tiled the ten x uh, low MA images. And then um, I think Aaron had gone in and taken some um, uh, high res pre expansion images of these specific cells. So he took a little little box in image J and circled it or, or, or surrounded that cell of interest. And then the idea is we're going to go back and look at a few of these later, um, and then we know which ones and have it in this map. So maybe you're going to look at a little region in the hippocampus or some other anatomical feature that, that's really you know, your baby. Um, and so you want to know what you're looking at. And I say it's great to have that copy of that maybe on your laptop and go use the core microscope or it in your own lab. Then you go in to look at uh, the specimen high resolution, and you can compare. You can see if things got mucked up badly. I think that the feedback is really important how well you're doing, uh, and uh, especially getting into a new method. I, I hope you're skeptical. Uh, I can tell you the methods do work, and they're awesome, and they're a lot of fun, but uh, I, would, I would advise skepticism and, and care, and go, go into it. Then we'll do this uh, 
Um, so the correlative measurement to see how bad our distortions are. And I also think if you want to do these expansion methods, you should be doing that as well. They, in our paper, and I think in some of Moya's papers, and maybe also in Casey's paper, they provide the software available. Right? So we found we could use a car, uh, freeware software. Um, Aaron wrote up a nice protocol with uh, sample data, sample input, uh, uh, examples of the how the data would look and detailed instructions. So you could go in, in two dimensions or three dimensions and follow just about the first of the sample data, you get the code working, and then you can plug in your data and see how to adapt it. Um, I wanted to say something about what do these plots show. I know it was the first time I saw these kind of distortion plots. I was a little bit, a little bit confused, so I'd like to take a second to tell you guys uh, what it is. Uh, so in this example, we have purple is the pre-expansion image and green is the post-expansion image. In this case, it's called the cell, but we did it for a bunch of specimens. And all we've done is changed the magnification of the green channel, rotated it, and translated it. So that's just rigid transformation in order to line them up. And things lined up pretty well, not perfectly. I think I put a, did I put it in? Yeah, and we, the software will actually do some, some of this distortion analysis to see, okay, you just, anywhere it's not white, um, it showed that we needed to have a little bit of uh, tweaking of one feature or another to line up. Okay. Um, so, uh, so we can analyze those distortions. And what are those distortions telling us? You get this plot, our best error on the y-axis is in micrometers, the, the distance measurement. And uh, that's on the y-axis. And you got another distance length on the x-axis. What, what are these things telling us? It's telling us over different length scales, and that's on the x-axis, what's the kind of average distortion that we're seeing? Okay, so if we picked a number, let's say at the 10 micron length scale, how much distortion do we see? Well, we say the root mean square error would be about 0.04 micrometers. Okay, and a lot of times we get these kind of shapes that sort of trail off, and this has a little bit to do with sampling and stuff. But overall, if you just you know, see this kind of slope and you look at this kind of value, you can say, oh, that's actually uh, substantially less than a percent. Okay, so you're hearing that you're being, you're doing quite well. Okay, and of course, you want to combine that with some visual inspection based on your prior knowledge about the specimen. Um, if you were to see 5 or 10%, I would be getting a lot more nervous. Okay. And you, you know, it's not to say it's impossible you'll get uh, useful information out of that, but uh, you should try to figure out what's going on. Questions on this? How do we measure this? How do we measure this? Yeah. Okay, so um, essentially we get out of, uh, so okay. I'll walk through this one real quick. This is showing the post-expansion image um, in purple, and it, that hasn't had any sort of warping done to it. And this is after the warping that would be done in order to match pre and post-expansion. Okay, so these are both post-expansion images, but one of them got tweaked a little bit in order to match this purple pre-expansion. Okay, so then we get out all of these sort of, and these vectors show the displacements necessary. Um, uh, and basically we get out um, that distortion map and by processing it and looking at the, the length scales of pairs of points, we get out uh, this, so we say, you know, you can clump all the stuff that's around five micrometer uh, distance scale and see how much uh, those errors were and we can do that. And I think, actually Aaron, does your protocol get some of this part? Yeah, so Aaron's protocol also has some detail on that. Hopefully at least you'll understand that um, so validation is important, so be careful. Um, this kind of analysis, which is even done in Boyd's uh, first paper, was a really nice uh, tool, along with common sense, skepticism, and just being careful about it. Okay. But um, do we need to do this in order uh, analysis every time, even if we do a repeated stain in the same engine? Ah, yeah, so the way we're doing things, I don't I think with this expansion, this EXM protocol that we're sort of, uh, sort of walking through, walking through here, this isn't good for repeated cleaning. This is going to be more like you have your three things you want to look at, or maybe four. If you're really creative, maybe you can get to five. It'll be hard. Um, those are the things you want to look at. Expand it, look at it, and, and then you're done. Yeah. Uh, Casey's stuff was really great. Uh, I think in his switch paper, he did like 26 stains, and in his uh, Map paper, they did I don't know, 10 or 15 channels, um, and but all that takes a lot longer, um, uh, longer to do. And so, 
Something like walk, jog, run. Not necessarily multiplex, but like, I know it's necessary to do this while setting up the method. Do you do it at least currently? Yeah, so I was trying to, okay, yeah, so you had asked two parts to your question. So we don't do it for every experiment. We do it when we first uh, try a new kind of sample, a new kind of prep. Okay. And after that, um, we might continue to do it once in a while. Occasionally you see something funny, just like any procedure, there's room for human error or otherwise, uh, a glitch or something, and if things start to look funny, we go back to it. So we never stray too far from it, though. If you do it every time, you're gonna go crazy. Uh, I don't know, do you guys go more than a few weeks at a time without doing this part of this? Sometimes, if you're doing the same sample, yeah. So it, you know, it might be every few weeks or a little longer, uh, but I'd say, um, unfortunately, it's a skill to develop. But yeah, we do multiplex imaging, but not multi-round uh, with this approach. Uh, I can say it's going to lack, it's, this approach is definitely going to lack the multi-round. There's probably a couple of tricks to get around the multi-round scanning, but it'll take some more development. And, uh, it's definitely not ready to roll. I, I don't know, we're not really pushing hard on that in any way. But I can say this, that the procedure is pretty fast. So if you could do the same day procedure for cultured cells with the blue rabbit hide prep, uh, you do easily next day in less than 24 hours. Uh, allowed for a long digestion overnight for um, uh, also for cultured cells. For brain tissue, I think it's pretty it's a pretty leisurely four days or so to get through the procedure. Um, uh, and um, you know it's using a lot of the same steps you might already have done with your conventional immuno. That's actually the first thing that comes with a with the conventional immuno scan. Okay, I wanted to take a second, there's a lot of words around here, numbers, but I wanted to take a second to say something about uh, super resolution microscopy and the place uh, for expansion in that. And uh, there's a lot of stuff here. I you know, cover everything from hardware costs to live, uh, obviously the expansion up to live. Um, hardware costs, I think, is a good argument for expansion. You can use the existing instruments. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, you caught me up to that is uh, working distance. Right? Let's say you're imaging a whole brain, uh, mouse brain, and I don't know, a big mouse brain centimeter or something, and it spans four times. Okay, so now you're imaging something four centimeters. That's really huge. You're gonna have to take a big resolution hit by having to go to optics that could allow you to image that deep. Okay, so sure you expanded it, but uh, maybe if you were just interested in the, in the hippocampus, right? If you're just interested in a narrow region, you'd probably do better to slice that out, expand a little piece, and look at that. So don't, which will allow you to still use uh, high NA optics, let's say NA. 1.0 or better, right? And you otherwise take a hit resolution there. But either way, it's great. You get to use your existing hardware. Um, all the other stuff, uh, SED, SINS, Pomson, they all cost a lot of money. And actually, I think you guys have some stuff here for SED and DSD, Pomson. Yeah, great. Um, okay, these methods tend to be um, better for thin set samples. <coughs> I sort of walked through that a little bit yesterday. Multicolor, I didn't talk a lot, a lot about that. It's still kind of tough to do great multicolor. Then <laughs> Palm and Storm, it's kind of okay, but you know, one channel's good and the other channels are not as good. It's still, still annoying. The resolution is sort of, it's a funny number, but it's somewhere between like 20 and 70 nanometers, depending on a lot of details. Um, but basically, uh, multicolor and uh, six are more challenging for especially these two methods, Palm Storm and Stead. The DXM does really well for that. And also, of course, you can go thicker. Um, but if your goal was just to go thicker and you didn't need higher resolution, I'd say you want to try Clarity, Switch, maybe Shield, uh, some of the CT Watson methods. Because um, if you don't need the higher resolution, don't, don't do expansion. This is really you know, for higher resolution. Okay? Um, and it can just make your life harder. Okay? The working distance is the signal. Uh, so the working distance being large would be a problem. The signal intensity is going down with your <coughs> So um, I like how uh, when Casey was, uh, was asked a question about, oh, which, which method should I use? He said, okay, what resolution do you need? That's a really important question. You don't want to just go high resolution because it sounds cool. That's going to just waste your time, uh, I guarantee. Uh, use the resolution you need to answer your question. And even though I'm like a super res guy, I'm often telling people just to go back to Google and Confocal and you'll probably be fine with that. Do the right tool, do the right job. Okay. Optimizing things takes a lot of our time. Careful with PA autocorrectors for precious tissues, although it's not a killer. There's some tricks for it, like oral hydride reduction. Um, 
this is a neural crowd, so imaging brain is probably, you know, probably going to be fine. But it's just a soft, mushy tissue. Maybe you've got primes to mimic other organs or other types of specimens. Um, tough structures that can be really difficult. Okay, I showed the fly uh, uh, sensory neurons that are right close to the uh, cuticle. Um, that's problematic. Uh, so it requires sort of adaptation of the procedure. And uh, you know, get out there and have some fun by uh, being careful and validating stuff. Okay, so that was my sort of portion of the stuff. Do you guys have any more questions for me in this sort of public format? Um, back to the dyes that you can do you have any suggestion for blue dyes? Like the attachment to the animal. Oh, where did they go? Hold on, sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the dye slide. Yeah, yeah. yeah, slide. yeah so um, mostly the blue dyes are not that good, and it's not having to do with expansion, it's just the general property. Their photon budget is low, background signals are higher. But we did use Alexa 405, and we have a, an image published in our paper showing that. But the, just the photon budgets tend to be low. We have a harder time uh, getting good, usable signals from those dyes. And I would say, um, until you really need that fourth amino channel or something, try to get by without it. So honestly, yeah, the, the, those, those dyes, are just, even for conventional fluorescence, uh, where you're not dealing with dilution by expansion, it's just tough to use. If you normally have a, your favorite chloride or a gazillion views blue uh, violet, you can use. Uh, Alexa 355, I'm not sure I have you. Yeah, Alexa 355, that's a Coumarin, Alexa 405 is a uh, Pyrene. Both of those, they have low extinction, um, and so you're dealing with a lot of background fluorescence. And uh, I guess you have a nice UV line for your stuff, or maybe multi photon. Uh, but uh, even in conventional, doing high quality conventional fluorescence is already tough with either of those dyes in my experience, for a good high resolution proposal. So I just, I would try to avoid it. Although we showed you can do it, but we don't push it. I, I actually think, you know, if you want to see your nuclei, it's a great, it's great. You can do it uh, push or adapting, and you can uh, still quite easily see the location of the eye. And actually, our, our first test, when we try a new specimen, did it expand well? Oftentimes we just use push and adapt because you know, the, mic, the, the nuclei should be 8 micrometers and did it expand to 30 or something or not? Uh, or did it rip up? Um, we should are we take more time? Yeah. questions for later. Sorry. Sure, yeah. Are you getting a bit behind on time? <coughs> so I think Eric's next. I'm going to give you How much do you have to show? Um, I can blast through it real quick. We can show it. Why don't, why don't you go ahead, you know, okay. I mean, well, I mean, we're flexible in the other. Yeah, I can't go for a long time. No, we actually yeah. didn't even hear you. Okay. It's just pizza. Just pizza. All right, I'm going to try to go through the slides really fast then. Um, I think uh, Josh actually hit a lot of the issues that uh, kind of, were kind of the broken record on, like, making sure that your uh, immune response are good. And maybe I'll just add a couple extra things about um, uh, some amino things. There were some questions about how red should the samples be. Um, a lot of times people say, well, don't you get tired of looking at immune uh, microtubules? Like, it's just boring. And um, they actually happen to be a great, like, gold standard. So, you know, you can do a microtubule stain and kind of see how bright they are by conventional and then by expansion microscopy. That will give you some idea of, you know, what the brightest expansion stain will be. And so, um, there are some really nice protocols for staining microtubules, and we encourage you to take a look at them. Uh, some of the, again, some of the important considerations are about extraction, fixation. There was some, there was some chatter about what the different fixators are, what things mask epitopes. These are all extremely important considerations for staining. Um, primary antibodies that can recognize uh, tissues that have been either blue or aldehyde or that are fixed. And then uh, a lot of times we also consider secondary antibodies. It's important for tissues like chlorophore. It's also important to uh, optimize uh, concentrations of these antibodies. How many dyes are on each antibody? Those are all the kinds of things we think about, and we'd be happy to talk about them more with you later. Um, so familiar things, again, amino staining. Uh, I think everybody pretty much knows that. We, we harped on the fact that it's really important to choose the correct chlorophores. I was going to go over some of the more unfamiliar things that um, are involved in the high scale formation. And uh, essentially, what I should have done is like bought a GoPro camera because 
my, I mean, my life isn't cool enough to actually have a GoPro, but maybe it would have been cool to um, follow a day in the life of uh, you know, what we do in the, in the long life. So there are many ways to do expansion. Um, this is kind of the way we've converted the pond for a couple of reasons. Um, we find some of the advantages are that it's low cost. Um, we can process each sample individually, and we can really um, skip on our antibody usage. We can use very low um, amounts of antibody. So we grow our culture cells on a 12 millimeter cover glass. Um, it's a little bit tricky to handle. You need good, you don't drink too much coffee, you have a nice pair of tweezers. Um, I, think, I think those things are quite manageable. Um, if you're kind of wondering, like, how do we form these hydrogels? Uh, we take a Teflon block, and there are many polymer, polymers that will work for this. It doesn't have to be Teflon. Uh, you can probably try a petri dish in your lab, um, just, just do a test run. Um, we take a 70 microliter droplet of this monomer solution, and, and it already has the initiators and the catalyst in it. And so here is my thin cover glass. The cells are going to be on the bottom side of the cover glass, and I'm just going to put it right onto this droplet of monomer. And that's going to polymerize for um, 15, 20 minutes or so. And so I know it's tough to see in my um, cracky cell phone picture, but this is the general idea. We've got the cover glass, the cells are on the bottom. They're going to be embedded in this hydrogel. And then I can just take the tweezers and pop the gel right off this tough on surface. Again, it's very hydrophobic. So you can see the cover glass is on the bottom, and I form these nice puffs of polymer on top. So we can pack these real little wells in Teflon. You don't need to do that. It's just kind of hard to get it from the machine shop. Um, really, the surface tension will hold the droplet nicely on the, uh, on the Teflon surface. So this, this sample goes into a digestion buffer, um, about a mil, and that fits nicely into um, like, a, like a 12 well plate. So we brew ourselves in a 24 well plate, we digest them in a 12 well plate, and then we are gonna expand them in a petri dish, so we're kind of just stepping up in size. So when you come back um, after you sleep, the cell has been, the, the sample has been digested. Um, you'll notice that it can expand slightly. So here's the original cover glass for scale. And the sample has popped right off that cover glass. So we've kind of released all whatever sort of adhesion and protein we're seeing on the bottom um, during the digestion step. Um, usually we don't keep the cover glass on, we throw it right away. Um, you fill the petri dish with water, you go out to have coffee, um, you change water a couple times. And once it stops expanding, um, it won't change size anymore. You can check with a, with a ruler, then, then you're done expanding. And you'll see that um, the size change really has been approximate four times. Okay, so we do our surgery. We, um, we get a lot of questions. How do you mount the gel? How do you make sure they don't slide around? So we just cut it with a sharp razor blade. I scoop it out with um, a large cover glass, a 0.5 cover glass. You kind of use it like you would just um, flipping a hamburger on a grill, just pop it right out of there. Um, and then what we need to do is we need to kind of release or get rid of any puddles of liquid that may be under the gel. Um, it, it's really important to check which side of the, in, in the case of cell culture, what side of the gel is your sample on. Um, there's some tricks for um, figuring this out. Maybe you can just talk to Tyler and I during the hands-on session. But essentially, if you're using an upright microscope, obviously you want the sample to be on the top side. If you're using inverted, they're going to be facing the glass. Um, so you need to know which side that is, and uh, like Josh alluded to, you could put a little cushion for Daffy in there to easily see the, the main nuclei. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to mount the sample um, on a polyglycine glass, so I'm going to have the cells on the bottom. So I wick off all the excess water by touching a few marks of the edge, and then that gets rid of any puddles that are kind of underneath. And then you really just simply slide the sample onto this polyglycine glass. and. Um, the, uh, the strong negative charge of the gel sticks very um, strongly to the polyglycine glass, and that's going to stop any sort of grit or wiggle that you'll see during the um, Just really quick imaging considerations. Um, like Josh mentioned, uh, do not image the, the sample in the gel before you've expanded it. So anytime that there may be free radicals or uh, any free radicals around, you can damage the sample. Um, it's always a good idea to check before you polymerize to make sure that your thing is good. Uh, it will save you a lot of time. And um, again, the expansion relies on having uh, a pure aqueous gel. So you're going to want to be using a uh, water immersion objective if possible. Um, the number is something like you're going to lose 50% of your light intensity above 10 microns if you're trying to use an oil objective into an aqueous sample that's more likely. So that's a significant loss. Uh, we get that a lot. Uh, it's really nice to use high-end water objectives if you can. Um, and 
and yeah, your example is gonna blow up a lot. So I think that's it. Go ahead and talk to you fast. Um, if you're asking questions or have a question, any questions in our session.